Okay, welcome everybody. We've got another builder interview today. I'm George Donnelly and I'm here with Jonathan Tuman. Welcome, Jonathan. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Excellent. So, uh, Jonathan, can you um, introduce yourself? Uh, you know, tell us uh, your name and, and, you know, a little bit about you, what you do in Bitcoin Cash? Sure. So, my name is Jonathan Tuman and I've been involved in Bitcoin since roughly like 2013. I've been a miner for um, about six years now, uh, industrial scale miner. I also have been active in development since 2015. I got started with Bitcoin XT and uh, then co-founded the Bitcoin Classic project to double the block size limit. And uh, with Bitcoin Cash, I've been active in dealing with scalability issues as well as the difficulty adjustment algorithm. So the difficulty adjustment algorithm that was deployed in November was uh, in large part my creation, also Mark Lenderberg's and a few other people's. Um, but yeah, my, my main passion has been for optimizing the uh, client performance and uh, dealing with scalability issues. I really want to see that a blockchain can scale to the hundreds of thousands or millions of, uh, thousands, millions of uh, transactions per second um, point with sufficient parallelization and uh, good code. So I'm working on writing that code. Cool. So uh, Bitcoin Classic uh, was in uh, early uh, kind of big block uh, full node attempt, right? Can, yeah. can you give us a little more background on that project? Yeah. So uh, Bitcoin XT was an eight megabyte um, initial change with doubling every two years. And the feedback from a few of the mostly Chinese pools was that eight megabytes initially was too much and that there had been a miscommunication between those pools and Gavin, uh, where the, the pools were saying eight megabytes is the maximum that's uh, acceptable. And Gavin heard, oh, eight megabytes is acceptable right now. And the pools were actually meant eight megabytes is acceptable eventually, um, but not right now. Mm -hmm. So with that feedback, uh, Gavin and I, as well as a few other people, um, Olivier, for example, Olivia Jansen, and uh, uh, and we uh, we created a client that would uh, immediately hard fork to a two megabyte limit and stay there until um, basically another hard fork was coordinated. And so that was cool. in um, January, basically of 2016. January through, well, for, for a while, I guess uh, uh, we deployed it, uh, deployed the code in around like March and um, would have been activated by uh, June or May or something like that, had had people uh, supported it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, excellent. So what are you working on? So you, uh, you know, you've been doing mining, you were, you know, absolutely key in uh, the new ACER DAA uh, for Bitcoin Cash, as you mentioned, uh, you know, you basically took that and you you made it happen. Um, so what what are you working on now? Um, so between like August and uh, November, I did a full time stint where I was basically working uh, with all of my free time on or all of my time really. Uh, on Bitcoin Cash. And during that time, I developed ScaleNet and, and got it deployed. Um, I also spent a lot of time working on the issue that we have with transaction chains in Bitcoin Cash. Um, so transaction chains, or more technically transaction trees or DAGs, um, with the current code in Bitcoin ABC, BCHN, um, and possibly a couple of other clients, uh, we get big O N squared computation requirements for chains. So uh, each transaction that you add to a chain or to a a transaction tree uh, requires amount, an amount of computation that is proportional to the number of transactions earlier in that chain. So each transaction takes more time to process than the previous one. And uh, that's that uh, big O n squared computation applies both for processing blocks as they come in, as well as processing transactions as they come in, although that's not uh, a critical path. So it's not a, uh, as big of an issue. Um, but also it, it uh, applies for uh, assembling blocks in the create new block or get block template um, functions. And with a, uh, a chain length of 85 transactions with a 32 megabyte block, it takes currently about uh, 13 seconds to assemble 
uh, the block template. And it takes mm. around four seconds to process a new block. Um, and my, um, my opinion is that the limit for how long the whole process of uh, assembling, uh, propagating, uh, validating a new block needs to take a absolutely less than uh, 20 seconds and ideally like two to five seconds total um, in order for it to be viable with acceptable orphan rates and uh, minimal centralization pressures. So when we have just the uh, block template um, function taking 12 seconds ish on by the way and this is on a fast computer this is on like a, a 4.4 gigahertz cpu um, mm. so like uh, that just makes um, even 32 megabyte blocks uh, borderline unviable and it makes anything larger than that um, definitely unviable um, uh, so in order to keep that down uh, we've had to keep the limit on the length of a, of a transaction chain at less than 50 and that helps a lot mm -hmm. because you know the the 12 second figure that's for an 85 uh transaction chain so if the limit's 50 then worst case is more like uh six seconds or so and uh typical cases will be much better than that um so um yeah in in around october i started working on this and i developed a new algorithm for handling these transactions that still gives us most of the benefits of the child pays for parent um, use case that this big O n squared code was originally written for, but without any of the big O n squared issues. It's, it's, um, it's linear with respect to mm -hmm. chain length. So each transaction takes the same amount of time, regardless of how long the transaction chain is. And it works for nice. all, all types of, uh, of transaction trees, not just linear chains. So a transaction can have multiple parents. Um, or multiple children, and you still get that big O n one. Sorry, big O n or big O one uh, computation properties. Um, so that's um, that code is now basically being reviewed. It's been I actually uh, published it in um, the last bits of it in late October. So um, we're hoping to get that um, reviewed and refined, and then merged into BCHN. Um, soon so that we can uh, either vastly increase or eliminate that um, that chain limit while simultaneously getting a large improvement in performance. Outstanding. So it, it, how does this compare to what uh, BU did in their uh, full node? Because I think their, their chain transaction limit is up around like 500 or something right now. Yeah. So the BU code has um, a different way of addressing it. Their, their code has a special case scenario uh, for the chain specifically, not for the trees, but just for chains. So as long as a transaction has only one uh, in mempool parent, then it's fairly easy to calculate what the, um, what the next transaction's uh, total fee rate, including all ancestors, would be without having to do any funky calculations and without having to do any approximations. Um, so the, the approach that I used works for any tree, not just linear chains. Um, and in order to do that, I did use some approximations. So I, um, um, the, so for um, the question that we're trying to solve is, um, should a miner include a transaction into a block given its fee and also the fee of all of its ancestors, all the transactions that it depends on. And mm -hmm. the easy way to do that, or the, the like obvious way to do that is just to sum up all the fees for all the ancestors plus that transaction, sum up all the sizes for all the ancestors plus that transaction and do that, that division. Um, and that's what Bitcoin Core did. And that's what uh, Bitcoin ABC and BCHN inherited from Bitcoin Core. And that, mm -hmm. because it requires visiting all of those transactions, that ends up being a big O N squared uh, calculation. And you can't just like, uh, compute summary statistics and store those summaries and then um, calculate based on like the previous transaction because um, they can have, uh, you can have like a diamond shaped uh, pattern where a single transaction has one ancestor through two different paths. And so you have to check for that and make sure that um, that it doesn't get counted twice. Um, so see. so that's like the, the issue. Um, and if you know that your transaction only has one parent, then you can't have that diamond-shaped pattern. 
And so BU used that property in order to, uh, to do their calculation. Um, the thing that I'm doing is different. I'm saying, okay, what's the worst possible uh, size for that entire package of transactions? What's the worst case fee rate for that entire package of transactions? And if you uh, do that worst case scenario and estimate what the worst possible thing is, then it becomes unexploitable. Anybody who's trying to, to craft a, uh, a tree or a, a network of transactions in order to take advantage of the miners is going to fail because the miners are being as pessimistic as possible with their heuristic. And so because miners can't be taken advantage of, um, it becomes just a matter of uh, the crafter of the transactions themselves uh, having the obligation to convince miners to do it, um, to, to include that transaction in a way that uh, is convincing to the miners. And because child pays for parent is such a rare use case in Bitcoin Cash, it's only when somebody screws up with the fee in the first place, and then they say, oh, I need to like bump up the fee. I need to pay an additional fee by adding this extra tr uh, transaction. Because it's such a rare use case, it's fine to have uh, people need to include an extra fee. Um, say they might, uh, uh, if we were using Bitcoin Core's calculation, we might only need to add like, I don't know, maybe 100 Satoshis to the, the total fee. But uh, if we're doing a worst case approximation, then somebody might need to do like 500 Satoshis or 1,000 Satoshis. And, you know, that's like a penny. So like, um, it's uh, not actually a big deal um, for us. And it happens like, I don't know, once a month that somebody makes a transaction like this. So I thought that that was uh, um, a pretty good compromise in terms of performance, as well as uh, making sure that there's no additional attack surface and still supporting the, the core feature that we wanted, which is to allow people to unstick their transactions if, they're, if they screw up and if they're desperate. Mm -hmm. So, um... Let's see. So you said that, you know, the burden is on the, the, the creator of the transaction to convince miners um, to process, you know, right. these complex uh, trees. Is there, does this have any implications at the wallet level? You know, would there need to be some, I don't know, some accommodation or some, yeah. So is there any implication at the wallet level? So uh, the, the calculation that my code is making will always include the transaction if the transaction includes a fee that is acceptable uh, for that transaction by itself and all of its ancestors also include a fee that is acceptable uh, for them. So um, this only happens, or this, this calculation only, this child pays for parent property only happens if somebody tries to include a transaction that pays less than one Satoshi per byte. So mm -hmm. if everybody's following that one Satoshi per byte rule, nothing ever uh, goes wrong. Um, so it's only if somebody does try to, you know, sneak in a one quarter Satoshi per byte transaction that this child pays for parent thing uh, comes into play at all. And uh, at that point, people are already manually uh, changing their fees. So uh, somebody would just need to use the child pays for parent feature or to like, uh, to I guess you don't even need it to be a feature, but you need to spend based on that transaction with a higher fee. And Electron Cash already has this functionality. It's already built into that wallet. Um, and partially because Electron Cash was derived, derived from Electrum, which was designed for uh, child pays for parent and replaced by fee for Bitcoin, for BTC. Um, other wallets, um, many other wallets do allow you to manually specify fees. So you would be able to do this with those wallets as well. Not all of them, but with most of them. But I yeah, see. so it, there's no possibility for things to go wrong um, because of the change to the code. Uh, there's only the possibility uh, that it can be harder to fix some things that would have gone wrong before anyway. Um, mm. So it's like it's only if somebody is using too little of a fee, even today for today's uh, uh, fee market, that um, there would be any differences at all in terms of how uh, how things would result. I see. So there's been some talk about removing child pays for parent. What? What's? But it sounds like this. Uh, your proposal would um, assume that it, it continues being present as a feature. Yeah. Yeah. So another right? way to deal with this big O n squared calculation issue is to simply remove the the um, the calculation entirely. Um, so 
we have basically three options. We can keep the ON squared, we can keep the slow calculation, we can, or two, we can replace it with a big ON uh, calculation, a linear calculation, i.e. get rid of the performance uh, problems, or three, we can not do the calculation. And my suggestion is, hey, we should do uh, option two, because then we can get about 90% of the benefits of child pays for parents with like 0.1% of the uh, computational cost and like 30% of the code cost. It's still you know, a significant amount of code that has to be reviewed, but um, ultimately, ultimately it becomes a question of what's more important, the code or the execution time. Okay, I see. So you're actually preserving child pays for parent, but you're making it much less expensive, radically more efficient. So much less computationally expensive, and mm -hmm. uh, the cost is that the child pays for parent calculation isn't quite optimal. It's a heuristic. It's an approximation, but it's still usable uh, for the use case that people might actually need it for. So sometimes, because uh, of these approximations, it may come out more expensive. Yep, exactly. Then, okay. A in terms who, of transaction fees. Yeah, the person or in who terms is of doing computations. The tr no, not in terms of computation, in terms of the fees. The person who is trying to get their uh, transaction confirmed with child pays for parent uh, sometimes, not always, um, but sometimes will need to use a significantly higher fee in order to get miners to notice it than with the okay. current accurate computation. Okay, I see. All right. So do you see this having any any like practical downsides in some of the use cases that people have talked about res with respect to the chain transaction limit, like, you know, gifts.bitcoin.com or, uh, you know, hand giving out um, airdrops at meetups from, from a single wallet or something like that? It would have positive effects on those because it would allow us to raise or eliminate the transaction chain limit. So how how high do you think it would be safe, you know, assuming this code is deployed, you know, maybe it still needs some polishing or some peer review or, or, or whatever. But let's, you know, let's say, you know, maybe a middle of the road case, you know, what what number would you put as to, in terms of a, a safe unchained transaction limit uh, with this, with your pro proposal? It depends entirely on the block size. Um, so with a 32 megabyte block size, you can fit about 100,000 tra transactions into a block, 100,000 transactions fit. Um, so the chain transaction size uh, would probably need to be maybe one quarter of that. And then if you uh, double the block size limit, then you can double the chain transaction limit. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty close to being unlimited. The only uh, thing is that some of the mining code can get confused if the size of a chain or the size of a, a transaction package gets close to the block size because it can't say, it's a little bit harder to, to say whether a single transaction can be included into that block when the uh, estimated package size for that transaction is close to the block because there are some inaccuracies and because there are some estimation errors, it overestimates the size of the transaction package. Um, it might not know that it can fit that transaction package into the block. So basically, that's the, the only thing. There's no performance limit anymore because the amount of computation required per transaction is the same regardless of how many transactions are in that chain. So, so the, okay. the answer, this short version uh, answer to your question is that there should be no need for a limit afterwards. The longer version is, yeah, there's sort of this like fringe uh, use case or fr this fringe uh, reason why there would still need to be a limit, but it's, it's a very, very high limit. And once we have like gigabyte blocks, then we'd have like 250 megabytes per transaction chain as like a, a rough approximation of what the limit would be. It just keeps growing. That's really interesting. That's that's encouraging. So is the is the code? What stage is the code at? Is it being? Uh, is it on any of the test nets or is it on scale net? Um, I often run it on my own nodes when I compile my own nodes for, from source, especially if I'm doing uh, benchmarking and development. Um, I like to try to get rid of the bottlenecks one at a time and look for the next bottleneck after having solved them, the previous ones. So yeah, I often run it on ScaleNet and there's no real point in running it on TestNet through your TestNet for because they don't have very much uh, in terms of transaction volume. But um, uh, I think I'm probably the only one who's doing that though. Um, I think that... Uh, 
yeah, I, I don't think that other people have copied my code into their own development branches yet. But okay. it's it's a pretty big performance improvement. It's like um, the the reduction in get block template time plus the reduction in block validation time is overall about a seventy five percent reduction in the total processing time uh, for processing a new block and uh, mining a new block. Um, wow! So it's it's a very large performance improvement, and like that on its own is probably enough uh, of, a, of a performance improvement to be able to double or maybe quadruple the block size limit. Um, there's still some like some networking issues that aren't addressed by this, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's it's sort of like a side effect for having fixed the the chain transaction um, performance issue. Turns out it's a performance issue. It, it affects other things. So, <laughs> so how how is ScaleNet progressing? You know, where are how big are you know how big are the blocks, or how big do you think the blocks could be, and when you know. Um, so let's see, I think it was about a month ago. Um, we got a bunch of people playing around with it and Axel Gemba was making a bunch of big blocks and Andrew Stone was making a bunch of big blocks and, um, Matrix, uh, one of the BCHN, uh, devs was making some surprisingly large blocks given that he was using a Raspberry Pi. Um, I think he made like some 100 megabyte blocks with a Raspberry Pi. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, Axel uh, made a chain or like a string of about 20 blocks that were all 255.9 megabytes in size. Um, the, Sweet. the consensus limit on the block size for ScaleNet is currently 256 megabytes. So basically mm -hmm. he was able to uh, make every single block be at the limit for a few hours consistently. Um, and this was using transactions that were generated live on the fly. They, they weren't like uh, pre-generated and then saved to disk and then replayed. These were actually uh, made on the fly. And so, um, so yeah, in terms of size, there's nowhere better to go or nowhere, no improvement possible uh, on things than that. Uh, that's already shown that you that we can make full size blocks uh, consistently uh, on ScaleNet. The, the remaining performance uh, questions are, can we make this so that these blocks can be processed quickly and efficiently? Um, and can we do this with low orphan rates and uh, with low money risk or lost by miners? And so that's the next step. And I don't think any of us were um, collecting careful uh, benchmark uh, stats or performance stats on block propagation for ScaleNet. Um, I also know that none of us have as far as I've seen, none of us have uh, any nodes inside China for ScaleNet. So all of the, mm. the nodes are running outside of China, which means that we have low packet loss between all the nodes. Um, and that's, I think, where the real uh, bottleneck is. It's with packet loss and uh, consequently low TCP bandwidth um, over packet lossy connections with high latency. Um, I do have a- Crossing the Chinese firewall, essentially. It's not actually a firewall issue. Um, it has often been described as that, but it's actually more of a monopoly and uh, intentionally degraded performance for non-premium service kind of issue. The scenario oh. in, in China for the telecoms is that there's two major telecoms, uh, China Unicom and China Telecom, that are granted by the government basically a, a duopoly. Um, uh, it's not a, mm -hmm. it's not a perfect uh, duopoly. There is also China Mobile, for example, which does some telecom services, but they're a relatively minor player. And given this duopoly, um, China te Telecom and China Unicom have chosen to consistently under-provision bandwidth at exchange points with other telecoms, uh, less so with each other, but uh, to a, a very large extent with international um, uh, telecom players. And so the the connections, the links between mainland China and the rest of the world are always under provisioned. They're always congested by design. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. China Telecom and China Unicom do this so that they can offer a premium service tier. Um, and the premium service tier is usually around 100 times as expensive. And the the price for that is inversely proportional to distance. So the closer the country that you're connecting to, the more expensive it is. 
it is more expensive to connect from mainland China th through a premium service to Hong Kong than it is to connect from mainland China through premium service to Los Angeles. Hmm. And that's wow. um, purely because of be this, is, this pricing is based on demand, not supply. Um, they have artificially constrained the supply in order to uh, be able to extract as much value as possible from the existing demand. And there's a lot more demand for low latency communication between Hong Kong uh, and China than from Los Angeles to China. Los Angeles to China, even for the premium service, is usually just a, a high uh, bandwidth or high throughput um, value proposition, whereas Hong Kong is a high, uh, sorry, low latency, high speed uh, proposition. So that's actually the issue that we're dealing with. And uh, because the links are under provisioned, uh, we get packet loss that is always high, but the amount of packet loss that we get varies based on time of day and day of the week and season and basically how much other demand there is. And it can be anywhere between like 2% and 60%. Um, mm. And TCP does not work right when you have uh, anything over like 5% packet loss. It gets, it gets uh, absurdly slow um, because it interprets packet loss as a sign that the link is congested and doesn't have enough capacity, which is sort of true. But um, if we just sent more packets, it's not going to change how much packet loss we're getting because the congestion is coming from everybody else. Um, so yeah, basically TCP will say, okay, we can't send any more traffic through, we should stop trying. When what we should be doing is we should be saying, uh, we can send more traffic through, some of it's gonna get lost, so we can just send some of that traffic twice, or we can send some, some redundancy information, some uh, error correction information, or some, uh, some uh, yeah, forward error correction information in order to be able to reconstruct the original message, even though we know that 2% or 60% of that traffic is going to get dropped. And mm -hmm. there are protocols that, uh, that do that, that offer that feature. And uh, unsurprisingly, these pro the, the most advanced and uh, useful of these protocols is something called KCP, which was written by mostly uh, Chinese nationals um, who wanted to do things like play games over the internet uh, with international players or watch Netflix. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's a, there's a system there. Um, and uh, one of my goals in the next like six months is to port it over and to make use of it. Uh, KCP, by the way, is like a, a second layer on top of UDP in case um, anybody in the audience is technical enough. So it, it gives us a lot of the features of UDP, which is giving us the ability to uh, control our own transmission rate and having datagrams or uh, not a stream, but uh, individual packets or individual datagrams that can be constructed in, in any order and that can be processed in any order instead of having to have uh, a sequence of uh, packets. And if one packet gets lost, then we have to uh, wait for that packet to get resent before anything else in that stream can be used. So mm -hmm. it gives us all those benefits, but it also gives us the reliability that we want from TCP um, and a lot of the other features that we'd want from TCP, but in a much faster um, and more optimized fashion. That's excellent. So I think, uh, you know, you know a lot about mining. Uh, I don't follow it terribly closely, but I have noticed that it seems like there is more mining happening in places like uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, Venezuela. And also we recently saw that uh, it looks like, looks like Jihan Wu has um, given up uh, the mining, you know, his mining assets in uh, China and seems to have taken the ones outside of China. Do you think that mining will be moving uh, out of China? Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be moving a little bit. I mean, basically, the mining happens where the energy is cheapest. And um, for the first few years of Bitcoin mining, the energy prices were actually inconsequential. Mostly what mattered was having the hardware, having the capital, having uh, the manufacturing capability um, to uh, to produce the equipment, and then once you produced that equipment, uh, either you were like Bitfury and you used it yourself, or you sold it on the open market for uh, vastly elevated prices. And because of that, the shipping costs were inconsequential. And mm. um, in that scenario, mostly just what mattered was how quickly you could set up new mines, and uh, that was mostly actually in China. 
after a while, um, like in 2016, when there was the downturn, and then again in like 2018, 2019, um, the mining profitability dropped and the electricity costs started to become significant. So people started looking for cheap power. And uh, China already had the well-developed uh, large-scale mining apparatus. So uh, the, those miners ended up just shifting their focus towards places in like Sichuan province, where they had uh, a ton of uh, run of the river dams that couldn't store very much water and had electricity that had to be used no matter what. And mm -hmm. because of that, and because it was remote, it's you know far western edge of China, uh, they couldn't transport it back to the cities very easily. So um, that gave a large incentive for the loads to come to where the generation was happening and to buy it at very low prices in a seasonal fashion, often mm -hmm. one cent or two cents per kilowatt hour. And so that was, um, that was what was driving a lot of the expansion in China. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it uh, in the 2016, 2018, 2019 era. Um, 2017 was just everybody was building everything everywhere as quickly as they could. Um, but now th those, uh, those dams have mostly been tapped out and the Chinese government has also started to crack down on that practice a little bit. Um, so that's no longer as good of an option. And since about 2019, people have been, maybe 2000, late 2018, people have been looking for other sources of energy. And they've been frequently focusing on other sources of stranded energy. And one mm -hmm. of the most popular ones right now is the uh, flared natural gas produced from oil wells. So oh, typically okay. when you're drilling for oil, uh, ultimately what you're doing is you're, you're drilling for hydrocarbons, for, for petroleum mixtures. And uh, those reservoirs typically contain a mixture of uh, liquid and gaseous hydrocarbons. So it contains mm -hmm. a bunch of natural gas and a bunch of oil in the same reservoir. The sale price um, is usually much higher for the oil. And the oil is also far more transportable uh, from, lo from remote locations because you can put it into trucks very easily. Whereas the natural gas is only really saleable if you can connect a pipeline to that location. Mm -hmm. And pipelines are capital expensive and they really only make sense if you already have a pipeline fairly close by. So, um, so some places have been able to do uh, natural gas sales and others are just pure oil plays. And uh, a lot of those pure oil plays are in Central Asia, Central Northern Asia in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in uh, other countries in, in that area. And when they, can't, um, when they can't transport that natural gas back to civilization, they usually just have to burn it. They usually have to just flare it. And so that's A, big source of pollution. Uh, B, um, it's terrible for greenhouse gases, because not, not because of the CO2, but because the flares are usually inefficient and they leak out a lot of methane. Uh, mm. some, somewhere between like 2% and 25% probably of the methane doesn't get actually burned. And methane is about uh, uh, 20, 28 times as potent as greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide is. So even that 2% is nearly as much greenhouse gas as the 98% that gets burned into carbon dioxide. And if it's 25, mm. then it's like 10 times as bad. Um, so that's, uh, so A, uh, particulate pollution, B, greenhouse gas pollution, and C, it's just wasted energy. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of miners have been saying, Hey, you're just, you're considering this gas to be a liability that you have to buy an expensive flare for and, uh, and flare it off and make sure that you have environmental compliance and make sure that you don't like kill, uh, all the people in the villages in a, you know, uh, 15 kilometer radius, or if you do mm -hmm. that, make sure that they can't sue you because they're too poor. Um, and the miners say, Hey, you know, why don't you just sell that gas to us and we'll burn it in like a generator. We'll do it efficiently and cleanly and we'll pay you like 20% of what the gas would be worth if you had a pipeline connected, which is a lot more than you can get because you don't have a pipeline connected. And mm. people have been doing that in Alberta, Canada. People have been doing that in uh, the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, in uh, Wyoming and a bit in Texas. And they've been also doing it in very large quantities in Kazakhstan and Russia because they just flare a lot more gas. And so, yeah, that's that's been a development since 2018, 2019, and that's why we see the increase in the mining hash rate 
in Central Asia. That is fascinating. I was not aware of that. Um, you know, I, I, I did read some stuff recently about how in Venezuela, actually, that they have precisely that problem. Same issue, yeah. Yeah, and on a, on a, on a large scale. Um, so this is really interesting because, you know, people want to make a big deal about the electricity uh, that mining burns, you know, but, you know, look at this. We're actually, you know, miners are actually uh, taking greenhouse gases that would have otherwise gone into uh, the air. Yeah, um, yeah. For the stranded gas, um, the flaring reduction, it is definitely a net reduction in the amount of greenhouse gases, um, not from the energy usage, but from the more complete com combustion of the methane. And that's kind of an accident, but uh, it's definitely a good one. Market forces at work, people looking for an opportunity, and wow. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, it would be it would be market forces at work if there were a cost to emitting methane, if that uh, greenhouse gas impact was passed along to the producer or to the the polluter, but it's not. Um, so in this case, it's it's not market forces that are solving this problem. It's merely an accident, which is, you know, oh, I would still call it market forces. Yeah. I mean, voluntary action, and you know, I mean, there's still there is still a cost. You know, they have to flare mm -hmm. it. Right. And um, yeah. But it's it's voluntary action and market forces Which acting is... on something that's completely unrelated to the actual issue. The actual issue is the emission of methane and people are just looking for uh, cheap energy. So that's how that's how the market works. That's like my it's... my grandfather, my grandfather, he um, so there were all the this in 1960s uh, Rust Belt what's now Rust Belt, Pennsylvania, all these companies had pallets and cardboard and computer uh, cards that they would, you know, they would have nothing to do with them. They would go into a landfill. He would go around, you know, he was a recycler. I mean, they called him a jug man then, but he would go around and pick all that up and, you know, do whatever it took to recycle or reuse that market forces, you know? Yeah. I mean, my opinion <laughs> is that we should have, a specific market force for these kinds of things. Like, for example, um, like I mentioned the, the pollution issue, the particulate emissions. It's really severe in a lot of uh, Iraqi cities, a lot of Iraqi towns, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, Iraq just doesn't have the political stability to be able to build those pipelines. So almost all of the, the gas that's uh, produced in Iraq gets flared. Mm -hmm. um, and that creates some towns where you literally can't see the sun during the daytime because the pollution Goodness. is so strong. And there's uh, extraordinarily high rates of cancer in these yeah. cities. Um, like people often don't live past their 40s just because they have uh, heart attacks or strokes or uh, lung cancer. And the market forces, if, if, they, were, if they were acting uh, rationally and uh, accurately, there would be some way of taking that externality, that cost to the local inhabitants and having the people who are benefiting from uh, burning that gas uh, compensate the people who are harmed from the burning of that gas. But unfortunately, that mechanism doesn't exist. Well, I mean, in reality, the, the victims have to take their case, you know, and if to, to, to the people doing it, I mean, you know, nobody guarantees that market forces will always work. They require the individual initiative of individual people. Um, you know, I mean, in the worst case, they need some guns. <laughs> I mean, if the local government, if the dispute resolution mechanisms are not working, if they can't get market-based dispute resolutions working, then, I mean, they have to arm themselves and, and take action. Yeah. That's, that's um... market forces, too. So Iraq already has like, you know, some people taking guns and taking action. Um, I know. So, and like, yeah. it, it's, it's not working very well for uh, the common village inhabitant. It's not working in their favor. Those kinds of mm. things tend to work in the favor of whichever side is the most organized. And mm. this is definitely the oil companies that are more organized. They have mm. the capital to hire, um, not just people with guns, but well-trained security uh, services with, right, with uh, um, armored personnel car carriers and uh, RPGs, missiles, uh, whatever. They, there's definitely like an uphill battle that would need to be fought by uh, mm. 
people whose grandmother is sick against. Yeah, because I mean, essentially, the oil companies are have, you know, relationships with first world governments, you know, they have the writ of uh, limited liability, they have corporate welfare, they have all these kinds of benefits. And your small villager can't really hope to compete with that, though, yeah. I do hope that some of the technologies that you know, we're working on, that Bitcoin cash can be a bit of an equalizer there. Uh, at some point. Do you? Do you see any any uh, potential for that? Hmm. I'm not sure that I um, can think of any mechanisms that would help solve this particular problem through crypto. Um, well, I think, I think we have to more... approach it from a larger scale, though, right? Because the more the more people, you know, use uh, Bitcoin Cash, the less people use fiat. And really, the power of the nation state of corporations uh, comes from the fact that we all have to use their money, you know. And so, if we're not using their money, I think that 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 just as initial first step weakens them. Don't do you think so, or what do you think about that? No, I think that the power of corporations comes from their uh, organization and their uh, like corporate collective knowledge and uh, structure. Um, like, I think that when you have specialization, where you have people who spend all of their lives, uh, or, you know, eight hours a day of their lives focusing on one very narrow issue, they become a lot more competent, um, on that issue and are able to forward their agenda much better than a million people who each spend two minutes of their day, uh, thinking about that same issue. And... Yeah, that mm -hmm. expertise, I think, is where uh, corporate power comes from. Have you also considered that they have uh, limited liability from the government so mm -hmm. that if they engage in uh, malfeasance, wrong action, etc., shareholders cannot be held liable? I mean, they can lose their equity, but they can't, you know, you can't pierce the corporate veil, essentially. Right. So and at the end of, of these... the day, individuals can't be held accountable. And the, I, th I think this creates kind of a agent, what is it, principal agent problem, or moral hazard, if you will. Yeah. And I think a lot of the um, issue there is that corporations, not only do they uh, have the parent company be incorporated, but each project, each, um, mm. each individual oil extraction project is a separate subsidiary. And so mm. lawsuits against that subsidiary uh, often can't, uh, produce the can't pierce the corporate veil between the subsidiary and the parent. So often, mm -hmm. like the worst case is that one of those subsidiaries goes bankrupt. So that's uh, a further liability reduction. Um, I tend to think that right. the solution to this issue isn't one of uh, litigation and lawsuits, but one of just simply requiring that um, anybody who pollutes should have to pay some fee to account for the externalities of that pollution. And I think so that like that a carbon tax, carbon tax, but for pollution, because like, you know, pollution directly kills people. It's uh, a well-established phenomenon. It gives people heart attacks and strokes and, uh, and lung problems. Um, like we've, we've had some experiments in which people have uh, been exposed to gold nanoparticles around 30 nanometers in size, roughly the size of a, of a combustion particle. And you can see that particle in the person's bloodstream three months later. Um, hmm. And when that's an, a combustion particle, instead of just being a gold particle, then it causes blood clots to form around it, um, which then go into your brain and give you a stroke or go into your heart and give you a heart attack. And this is one of the uh, larger causes, not the largest, not the only cause, but one of the larger causes for heart attacks and strokes in modern society. Like we know how this happens. And uh, so we should just account for those health effects and make sure that anybody who is producing these particles, which go into other people's bodies, have to compensate uh, these people for the the loss of uh, life and health that they experience. Okay, interesting, interesting. So let's uh, change gears a little bit back, back to Bitcoin, to Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin yeah. Cash. <laughs> so considering the big picture, yeah, let's take a look at the Bitcoin Cash big picture for a second. Where do you think that the ecosystem needs to go in order to achieve the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash vision? You know. What do we what do we need to focus on in 2020 and 2021 and beyond in order to get there? So um, I think that a lot of it is uh, that we need better marketing. Um, we need better like 
the main bottleneck right now in adoption is people uh, using it. And um, one thing that we can do to help with that is to address the fidelity problem. I think that there is still some extent to which um, large potential use cases haven't been developed because uh, those developers or those uh, businesses haven't seen in a convincing fashion that Bitcoin Cash can handle any transaction load they throw at us um, with, you know, like a one or two year lead time if it's a very, very large uh, transaction load. So I think that um, one thing that we can do is to make some large strides in uh, increasing the capacity limits and uh, enabling those uh, things. That's not the only thing, that's not, probably not going to be the most um, uh, important thing, but it is one thing we can do. Um, beyond that, I think we just need to um, get more people to use it. Um, one thing that's always been bothering me is the, the core trolls. Um, like whenever I have a conversation with a friend and I mention Bitcoin Cash, if, they're, if they have had any uh, contact with crypto before, they usually are familiar with the um, troll responses or the, like the troll attitudes uh, towards Bitcoin Cash. And that's been uh, something that we've had to overcome um, anytime we want to sell it to somebody or sell the, the concepts, sell the, um, the, the value proposition of Bitcoin Cash. We have to overcome that. Um, so I think that it would be useful to, if we can find some way of, um, of resolving that issue and um, finding either a marketing strategy by which uh, we can advocate for Bitcoin Cash without having to uh, deal with the misinformation about, um, about Bitcoin Cash being a scam or whatever, or find a way to just resolve those, uh, those age-old conflicts and get people to stop um, spreading that misinformation. Hmm. Yeah, I don't... I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't see that going away until like I, I, I see us doing something else that's going to make them irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't I don't see us directly like everybody's always generating new ideas. Oh, you just got to do this. So oh, here's an example of how I shut up this troll. I, I personally I consider that a waste of time. Right. We, we, ju we just need to outbuild them. You right. Know? So one of the don't ways you think? in which. One of the ways in which we might be able to uh, to address this issue is by bypassing it, um, mm -hmm. by having products that um, that people just use without knowing or caring that it's Bitcoin Cash on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, having things that just work that have um, other branding, like maybe Spedden or or maybe uh, Purse. You know, somebody comes to the purse brand and they come to that use case and they go through the steps to use that uh, product and Bitcoin Cash is just incidental. Um, it's incidentally what they end up using. Um, and in that case, what we'd be offering is something that has utility, something that actually works. And uh, we're, if we're selling it by its utility, then we don't need to sell it by... Uh, its name and its reputation, and the name and reputation will just be a side effect of that. So I think that that's one uh, potential strategy. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So do you think that uh, the, the chain needs to have more functionality in order to, to, you know, to say, to get the next level of adoption, say 1 million or 10 million? uh new uh users or do you think that it has enough functionality today it has enough functionality today to be able to solve venezuela it does not have enough functionality today to be able to solve the world's problems um mm -hmm. and it's also um it's hard to convince people to use uh something that has enough functionality for their uses today if they are trying to build something that's going to solve uh, issues tomorrow. It doesn't have enough capacity for, um, for a country like uh, the United States. It doesn't have enough features to be able to reach parity with Ethereum, for example. 
Um, it has a nice set uh, or like nice balance of scalability and uh, pro programmability, but um, unfortunately, like uh, we do need. I think we do need to um, to make a more compelling use case and make it so that not only is it a bit better than everything else, it's so much better that it becomes an obvious choice. Mm, yeah. So what do you think about, for example, uh, I was talking with Roscoe at Any Hedge recently. Um, you know, he basically said that, uh, you know, via uh, BCH smart contracts, we can add, subtract and divide, but we can't multiply. We need larger integers. I was also talking with Andrew Stone about uh, group tokenization. What do you think about those uh, proposals? Do you think um, yeah, support they're a priority? The, I support the opcode stuff. Um, I have mixed opinions about the um, the group token thing. It does make a significant change to the programming model or to the assumptions of how UTXOs work um, and how it also makes a significant change to the the structure of the, the fundamental UTXO database on disk. Um, currently, every transaction saves uh, all of its uh, UTXO data in one place in like mm -hmm. the UTXO. And uh, the op group thing would have two places that things get saved. It would basically double the number of disk accesses uh, for, for the worst case transaction. And that can have some pretty significant uh, impacts on scalability. So, um, so I have some concerns about okay. that, and I would like to um, see at least some better analysis of that. Uh, it also, um, and this is a, a significant fundamental change, it also eliminates the property of Bitcoin Cash script or Bitcoin script by which scripts are a, uh, a pure functional or a pure function. Um, with no side effects. With mm -hmm. op group works by having side effects in the programmatic sense. And uh, that makes the static analysis, that makes the, the uh, theoretical analysis of how the script functions much more complicated. Um, I see. I mean, it, it basically, uh, like when Ethereum, um, when Ethereum's founders were creating and designing the uh, system, they chose to use an account-based model instead of a UTXO-based model. And mm -hmm. the op group functionality sort of hybrided uh, adds in some of that account functionality and adds some statefulness um, to, uh, to the system. And um, that might be the best way to, to, uh, to add uh, tokens and accounts in a performant matter, or it might not be. Um, we do know that Ethereum is having a lot of issues with scaling, and those issues are directly the result of the way they designed their uh, their account database. Um, not entirely okay. because they have an account database, but also because of the uh, Patricia Merkle tree that they use. But it's still related. The fact that they have um, state um, and that it's not a, uh, merely an immutable record of uh, of a transaction does add a significant amount of database overhead. So, I see. So um, previously, you've said you're in favor of shorter block times. So mm -hmm. where where do you think we stand in terms of uh, either getting shorter block times or uh, some kind of instant finality finality like um, Avalanche or uh, I forget the name of the proposal that be you. Storm. I think Storm. Yeah. Or so, something else. So um, whether we reduce the block interval, the, the base block interval or not, is mostly a political issue. Um, we can make it work technically, but the community needs to decide if the benefits of that outweigh the social political costs of uh, a change like that. Um, my opinion is that it should be uh, a net win, but um, it needs to be a consensus thing. It needs to be uh, something that the vast majority of uh, Bitcoin Cash users and stakeholders agree to. Otherwise, it's drama for no um, proportional benefit. Um, mm -hmm. The other things. So um, I have uh, 
substantial technical doubts about the viability of avalanche preconsensus for enabling short-term transaction finality. There mm-hmm. has never been a good specification uh, for avalanche preconsensus, and the informal descriptions of the strategy have always, as far as I've seen, always left a very important point unaddressed. And that point is whether, uh, or what rather happens when you have the proof of work consensus disagreeing with the avalanche preconsensus. Hmm. If somebody mines a block containing a transaction that avalanche said was the wrong transaction and was the double spend, what happens? Is that block overruled? Or is that block uh, allowed to, or like built upon? And if the block is overruled, then Bitcoin Cash is no longer a proof of work currency. And proof of work Mm -hmm. is basically just a way to waste energy for no actual uh, benefit. And the security model becomes entirely dependent upon the security of Avalanche, which means that Mm. uh, all of the proof of stake uh, issues with uh, nothing at stake issues, et cetera, um, and the the lack of cost for doing 51% attacks, those become manifest and those uh, issues become pervasive in Bitcoin Cash. On the other hand, if uh, if Avalanche is ignored when Avalanche disagrees with proof of work, then Avalanche has no teeth and it doesn't provide finality and you can still do the fini tax, uh, the, the minor assisted double spend attacks. And um, so in that case, uh, many use cases, many merchants, exchanges, et cetera, would still need to wait for uh, at least one confirmation, possibly six or 12. And um, Mm. so I'm, because I haven't seen this issue addressed and because I haven't even seen the proponents of Avalanche on BCH uh, talk about it in in an intelligent way, I'm skeptical that that can be made to work. Um, Mm. Storm, on the other hand, um, I think that there is some more viability to that. Um, the promises of something like Storm are not as large as for um, for the for what like Avalanche's proponents have been making, but I think that they are uh, um, more technically viable. Um, however, I think that Storm might not be the most efficient way of doing what they're trying to do. Basically, what Storm is trying to do is to take the blockchain and convert it into a block DAG. It's trying to make another layer of weak blocks um, that are uh, uh, involved in the consensus process, but not as important as the full proof of work blocks that we uh, uh, get. And so Storm would have like uh, a main block followed by a bunch of uh, weak blocks that are like uh, connected to each other, connected to another main block. So you have like this branching out and then branching back in kind of pattern. And I think that um, that is one way to uh, design a DAG for um, for a block DAG for uh, a cryptocurrency. But I think it's actually not the most efficient way. And I think that if you just get rid of that uh, two level system or that two layer system and just make everything a DAG, that the algorithms work out better and you get uh, better performance, better efficiency, and uh, faster finality and, fa- and uh, um, fewer centralization effects, better scalability, et cetera. So I would like to see some investigation be done into um, like fewer DAG solutions where there is no anchor block or there is no main block and everything, every block uh, can re- reference multiple uncles or uh, multiple ancestors, along with some inf- information about what is the desired uh, canonical ordering. And uh, I think that if we do that, that we can probably get uh, block intervals down to like the five second range um, without wow. having the the centralization effects. And um, this would be a very large change to the code. It would be something would, that would probably require multiple years to be uh, deployed. But I think if we did it, we would be very happy afterwards. We'd be like, you know, pissed off and, and frustrated before, but like um, <laughs> uh, the pain would, I think, uh, pay off very well. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's like I think the most ambitious school. Um, the less ambitious schools are something like uh, Storm or Bobtail um, or a simple block t- block time reduction. I think we could. Uh, 
reduce the block times to about 60 seconds, maybe even 30 seconds with no significant adverse effects on scalability of Bitcoin. And the only adverse effects would be the political drama that we'd generate along the way. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a matter of uh, which strategy we, we want to take. Oh, and by the way, there's also the uh, zeroth strategy, uh, which is the double spend proofs, which is going to give us about like 80% of the benefit of maybe 60 to 80% of the benefit of uh, shorter block times without any of the cost. Um, it solves double spend issues for most retail um, and online purchases. It doesn't solve the Finney attack. It doesn't solve the minor assisted double spends, but most of the other um, scenarios are very nicely addressed by double spend proofs. So um, that might just be enough. That might be uh, good enough. Um, it won't be enough to accelerate transfers between exchanges, for example, but um, a lot of the other stuff will be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fascinating analysis. I think shorter block times are interesting from a marketing point of view, from addressing you know mainstream users who um, you know might give them a little more security to have a confirmation or two. Yeah or to otherwise address that issue somehow in the uh in the ui of you know a, a wallet that's, that's directed at the mainstream uh but i can tell you that uh without any doubt that the abc proposal for avalanche uh absolutely included uh the idea that avalanche would overrule that avalanche voters uh, would overrule uh proof of work and that's that's one reason for example that i I kind of soured on that idea uh, because I agree that would make proof of work irrelevant at best. So um, well, I, I don't think that there's any reason that like uh, making proof of work irrelevant is uh, a problem. Like I don't like proof of work. Um, I think that it uses a lot of energy and it's, and it's wasteful. I wish there was something better. Um, I just think that uh there are problems that happen with naive implementations of proof of stake and that um, the avalanche on BCH proposal doesn't have enough features to prevent those problems from happening. So uh, proof of work is not necessary if you can do something else like proof of stake securely and in a decentralized and fair fashion that uh, is censorship resistant. I just, uh, am skeptical that I, I really don't think that Avalanche on BCH is going to be that thing. Um, mm. Like, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the work that Ethereum has been doing with Casper. I think that they have identified and addressed all of the uh, the issues that come with doing proof of, uh, proof of stake. Um, but proof, doing proof of stake correctly with Casper, uh, for example, is a very complicated process and it, it's something that they've been working on for years and um, and it requires a lot of uh, careful examination of the game theory and you know setting up slashing mechanisms by which a bad actor can have their bad acting detected cryptographically proven and then punished and have their uh, ability to vote on uh, the next block removed and until that kind of code is written, I don't see proof of stake like uh, as being produced, or sorry, proposed in Avalanche on BCH as being safe. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm not saying proof of work is something that uh, we have to use in order for a cryptocurrency to be safe. It's just that um, it's a lot easier to do it safely and it's uh, easy to do proof of stake poorly. And I think that uh, the ABC proposal would do it unsafely. Okay. Well, Jonathan, this has been an outstanding conversation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Do you want to add any final thoughts? Let people know where they can find you. Is there anything people can help you with? Do you need anybody for any tasks or, or do you need help uh, with your development or anything with ScaleNet? Go out there and make cool things. <laughs> All right. Okay, Jonathan, thank you so much.